Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning is the gospel reading from St. Matthew chapter 22. As Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love fall, and I didn't realize how much I missed it until experiencing the last few weeks of our first fall here in Colorado Springs. I mean, with every day that passes, it's it's amazing how you can see the slight changes uh, every day of of leaves that are taking new colors and trees starting to shed those leaves. We love this weather. Uh, And for those of you who have been following the lectionary, you may have noticed that the assigned readings have also begun to change. As we near the end of the church here, the scripture lessons begin to teach more explicitly about the end time, the last day, that reality, and what that will be like. The readings can often have an uncomfortable nature to them as they describe issues that we don't like to think about. Such is the case with our gospel reading this morning. As Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast. Now, we could attempt to lighten the burden of this text by recognizing that Jesus is telling the parable to Pharisees who are moments from plotting his arrest. I mean, rather than telling this parable to Christians who are faithfully sitting in worship this morning. But for those who are willing to listen... Jesus' parable paints a tragic picture of what happens when people are unaffected by the generosity of the king. Jesus creates two scenes where people live disconnected from or ignorant to the king's generosity. In the first with those who ignore the invitation in the first place, and then the wedding guest who apparently didn't read his. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Now, how would you describe the kingdom of heaven to someone? Maybe it would look something like the picture we get in Isaiah 25, as we saw earlier from the Old Testament reading as we see this picture of this holy mountain uh, uh, where there's this great feast of of incredible food, of of well-aged wine, an endless party. Maybe something like that. You know, one of those parties that uh, you would never dream of, of not attending. You know, a party that you can't believe that you're invited to. You get to be part of this. And yet, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven here in this parable, the reality that Jesus describes in his parable is that of a kingdom, the kingdom being like a wedding feast that none of the invited guests want to attend. Not just any wedding feast, but the biggest party the people in this land would ever know. I mean, the king's son is getting married, and the king is sparing no expense in the celebration. But when the day arrives, none of the invited guests come. And somehow this is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. Well, again, he sent other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and and went off one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. How many times does the king need to ask his guests to come? I mean, the initial invitation should have been enough. The personal announcement from his servants on the day of the feast should have covered any gaps in communication. But this king is willing to even send out his servants a second time 
to go and, and, and reach out to his invited guests that have ignored him already. Only this time, the message increases in urgency. In case you didn't get the message before, dinner is no longer in the future. The feast is ready. My best animals have been slaughtered and prepared. There is no more prolonging this event. Please come now. But the invited guests have a clear response. We would rather go to work doing what we do every day rather than attend your once-in-a-lifetime event. What you've done for us means nothing and will have zero impact on our lives. And then some of the wedding guests even are so against attending this event that they shame and kill the king's servants who come and announce it. We don't want to hear another word about this feast. How many ways do we have to say it? We aren't coming. Well, the king was angry. And he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out on, into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Those original invited guests should have seen this coming, right? Did they actually think the king was going to cower in response to their message of bloodshed and simply just go away? I mean, not a chance. He's the king. And spurning his generosity is an offense that should not be taken lightly. Now, most of us, I would hope, are not at the point where we would kill the king's messengers for the invitation they carry. You know, Jesus is clearly indicting the religious establishment of Israel who facilitated the death of the Lord's prophets, who have ignored the message. We, on the other hand, are the Gentiles who the king invited off the streets. And I'm sure most of us are ready for that great feast that is described in Isaiah 25 and wouldn't miss it for the world. So what does this parable have to do with us? Well, in the third commandment, we read, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and His Word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. From the beginning, the Lord has set apart a day for us to pause our work and find rest in Him. I mean, He modeled, for this, modeled this rhythm for us as He created the world in six days and rested on the seventh the Lord generously offers us this day of rest every week by inviting us to gather around His Word and His sacraments, to find rest in His teaching, to find rest in the forgiveness of sins that He proclaims to us, to find nourishment in His body and blood broken and shed for us, a, a heavenly feast He provides not with the death of His finest animals, but of His Son dying on a cross for us in our place then we might not have to bear the wrath of the Lord, but rather live in His great and generous love for us. How often do we look casually upon our Lord's invitation to rest? How often do we turn to our other business or pleasure instead? How easily do we allow other things to take precedence over gathering together as the body of Christ around His Word and Supper? How readily do we allow other things to take and fill the time the Lord has invited us to set aside as sacred? This time when He works on us and shapes and forms us and gives us His rest. I mean, one should hardly reduce this parable to be a warning against 
missing church on Sunday. But this is certainly a wake-up call for us to see that there are consequences for rejecting the Lord's generosity. That we do not remain neutral in our position. That, that as we struggle in our sin, our inclination will always be to despise the word of the Lord. It may start with legitimate excuses for other things that we need to do. Like, like the invited guests in the parable who, who went back to their farms or to their businesses instead of to the wedding feast. But the sinner in each of us ultimately desires to say, don't tell me how to use my time. And and it despises the generous thing that the Lord wishes to do, whether it's in our lives or, or the generosity that He wishes to show others. Our sinful nature is inclined to despise that, to be removed from that disconnected from that, living a life that is not part of that story of generosity. And that isn't a small thing. The question Jesus invites us to ponder this morning is certainly, in what ways do we reject the king's generosity? It's not just in the big things and say, it's the small things as well. Because they aren't small things. You know, there's one more part of the parable that Jesus includes. You know, the king goes out and finds other guests to, to come and, and, and partake in this feast. He goes and finds them, and the servants find them on the streets. People who are both bad and good, but, but either way, at the end of the day, the wedding hall is full. And so the king then goes and starts walking around the party, and he notices a guest who is not in proper attire for the event. He says, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? The man just stands there speechless. There's no attempt to explain what happened. No pleas for mercy because they were the only clothes that he had or or somehow he was mistaken. No, he remains silent. He remains unaffected by what is going on around him. He's there, but he's not. And his rejection of the king's generosity is no different from the invited guests at the beginning of the parable who didn't want to come in the first place. There are lots of ways for us to reject the generosity of our king, of our Lord. But I want to close this morning with a clear picture of who our king is. You see, if we try to bring him on our level as we listen to this parable, he comes across as being kind of needy, petty, judgmental. At best, he is a victim. But Jesus, you know, either way, he doesn't go out of his way to create this character that you fall in love with in the end. Does he? But remember, Jesus is using earthly imagery to teach about the kingdom of heaven, something far greater than what we would be able to understand on our own. And the invited guests are not simply refusing to come to a wedding, but they've refused to come to their own wedding. Did you notice that a bride is never mentioned in Jesus' parable? The king's invitation is is much deeper for these guests to just have mere attendance at this event. The invitation is, is much deeper. He's inviting them to be part of the family. Inviting them to enjoy the gifts of his generous heart. To live forever in the arms of his son. A bridegroom who loves his bride more than she could ever imagine who's willing to give his life for her, to give his life for you. Your king has given you more than an invitation. He has sealed you in holy baptism, giving you a generous promise that he will never leave you or forsake you, but will always and forever call you his child. That the rags of your sin 
the rags that your sin has dressed you in, will be covered in the robes of his forgiveness. That you will always be ready for the wedding feast that is coming. This is his invitation to you. This is his promise to you. This is where he invites you to be part of this story of his generosity that is flowing out to all people. This is the story of our generous king. And so we look forward to that day. That day that we see in Isaiah 25. That that day when we will be celebrating an endless feast. A feast of well-aged wine. a A feast of rich food. A feast where we live in peace. A feast where we get to live in victory because death is no more. That we no longer live in this story where there is bloodshed and heartache and, 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 and all of the other ways that sin wreaks its havoc. But there, the day is coming when we will live in celebration. Where we get to enjoy this time with our King forever. So Jesus invites us to allow that reality, that promise, that hope to be part of our daily lives. To be part of us as we encourage us, as we do seek out that generosity of our King, as we see it all around us, as we allow it to flow from us to those who need it. That is the incredible story of our generous King. The day is coming when we will say, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in our Lord Jesus. Amen.